what is a retreat? Like many of you, I'm sure, have done many retreats in your lives. And there is no normative definition of a retreat. You know, nobody should come and say, this is what a retreat is meant to be. No, no, a retreat is a retreat, and there's all kinds of retreats. But I want to begin just with the word. You know, the word retreat, you've heard it so often. It's interesting to reflect that originally it was an army image. That's an army metaphor. The first people who went on retreat were soldiers, military people go on retreats. And when do they go on retreats? When it isn't going very well. <laughs> See, when you're in battle and you start losing, you start losing ground, you start losing men, you start losing people and so on, things aren't going well, then an army would do a retreat. They would pull away from the battlefield. They would re-strategize, regroup, resupply, do some things. So it's a pulling away from the front to re-strategize, regroup, rest, get ready. That's the original meaning of the retreat. And for a long time, the, the word kind of went into abeyance, that nobody used that word. Church circles used it. We kind of saved the word. And then sometime in the 70s and 80s, it just made this huge comeback. So today, everybody does retreats. Microsoft has retreats. Right? Faculty has retreats. I know our faculty goes on a retreat every year to begin the school year, but it's not a retreat like this. We go and we do business and so many. You pull away, and companies have retreats and so on. But now we're talking about a religious retreat, but just that was the original word. I want to give you three biblical images, but we're going to work with the last one. And like I said, there's no one normative. This is what a retreat's supposed to mean. There's many different kinds of retreats. I want to talk about a couple and then the one, the kind will do. This will be a particular kind of retreat. One of the original images for retreat in scripture is the image of the lonely place. And it's in Mark's gospel. Mark has this instance where he says, and it was right after the first missionary experience. Jesus sent the, the, the disciples out in pairs to do missionary work. And they went out to different towns and so on. And they came back, and it seems this had gone really well. Mark said they came back, and they said, you know, we cast out demons, we did miracles, we healed the sick. And one text said, and we even saw Satan fall from the sky. I've never had a success like that, ever. You know? <laughs> and Mark said they were, they were full of energy and I imagine full of themselves and full of grace and full of many things. And, they said, and Mark said, and then so many people were crowding around them that there wasn't even time to eat. Very busy. So many people were crowding around, there wasn't even time to eat. Then Jesus said, let's go away to the lonely place and rest for a while. First retreat. Jesus calls them out of the busyness of their ministry and so on to the lonely place where you're going to rest for a while. It's a retreat. The second biblical image uh, is the image of the desert. The desert became a place for retreat. So Jesus, right after his baptism, before he entered his ministry, he went into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights and he fasted and he prayed. So he went on a retreat. And I think many of us, especially those of us who are religious in this room, priests and sisters and so on, that's kind of the image of retreat that we were raised on. You know, many religious communities, dioceses, you had to have your annual retreat. And the idea was, this wasn't the time you looked forward to. And in fact, you're supposed to look forward to a retreat. You know? But it was a time your hair was supposed to turn white. See, you were going into the desert. Jesus went to the desert, and there you do battle with Satan. And you know, you, those are times when you fast. And so we'd go and retreat. And, and the whole idea was you cut yourself off from sensory enjoyment. So no music, no sports scores, no newspaper. No, see, you pulled away, and this was kind of the image of the desert. And the idea was this was supposed to be a time of, you know, of deep reflection and, you know, facing your demons and facing your chaos. Like literally, your hair is supposed to turn white. And you can tell I've done a number of good retreats, okay? <laughs> See, it's a, you're, in, you're in the desert doing battle with Satan. Now that's an image, and those are valid images. There are times in our lives when we need the lonely place. There are times in our lives when we need the desert. You know, time to face your chaos. But there's a third biblical image, and that's the one I want to take this weekend. And that's the image of the Sabbath. That's the original, the first retreat of all retreats. There's a very rich, rich theology and spirituality of the Sabbath. 
And you know the Genesis account. It said, in the beginning was the formless void. Then God breathed the Spirit over the formless void, and he said, let there be light, and light separated from darkness. Then, and there was morning and evening the first day, and then God said, let the land separate from the water, and there was morning and evening the second day, and so on. Some cynic once said, after, if you read the Genesis account, God did what he didn't, then he called it a day. <laughs> okay. and he called it a day. But anyway, then we get to the sixth day where God made the man and woman. That was done specially, in God's image and likeness. And they said at the end of the sixth day, God looked at all that he had done, and he saw that it was good, and feed it was very good. And then on the Sabbath day, God rested. That was the first sabbatical. Notice the word sabbatical comes from the word Sabbath. Sabbath? Sabbath means sabbatical, okay? And now, there's a whole spirituality and theology to this that, you know, we used to understand this and kind of do a little bit still implicitly, but I know my parents' generation, they understood this. Today, because of the fast pace of our culture, we're slowly beginning to lose our spirituality and sense of the Sabbath. Okay, what is the Sabbath? Well, literally, the day means the seventh day. Now, Christians have moved that day. For Jews, the Sabbath is Saturday, which is the seventh day of the week. We've moved it to the first day of the week, which is Sunday, because we've moved the Sabbath to Christ's resurrection, to celebrate the resurrection. But what is the Sabbath? Well, the idea is that there's supposed to be a rhythm to time. The way God sets up time in Scripture, there's supposed to be a rhythm, and it's supposed to work this way. The idea is you work for six days and then you have a one-day sabbatical. See, we work for six days and on Sundays you're supposed to go on a one-day sabbatical. Then you're supposed to work for six years and then you're supposed to go on a one-year sabbatical. But only academics are ever lucky enough to ever get that, you know. See, so you work for six days, one-day sabbatical. You work for six years, you have a one-year sabbatical. Then you work for seven times seven years. It's 49 years. Then there's supposed to be a jubilee year. And a jubilee year is supposed to be a Sabbath for the whole earth. John Paul called one of those in the year 2000 to celebrate the year 2000, a jubilee year. That's supposed to be a mega Sabbath for the planet. The whole planet's supposed to be on Sabbath. And then the idea is you work for a lifetime and you go on an eternity of sabbatical. Heaven's going to be a sabbatical, you know. See, you rest in God. So that's the rhythm. Six days work, one day sabbatical. Six years work, one year sabbatical. Seven times seven years, a mega sabbatical for the planet, a lifetime of work, and an eternity of sabbatical. See, but what is this famous sabbatical? See, there's supposed to be this rhythm. That's supposed to make your, your put the rhythm to your life. There's a rhythm to time. But... But what, what, what is, a, is, a, is a Sabbath, okay? What is Sabbath time? Those of you who are older Roman Catholics and Protestants, you'll recognize this. When we were kids, you know, they, when, when Sundays used to still be a bigger thing inside of, you know, Christian spirituality and practice and so on, remember we had all these questions about what could you do and not do on a Sunday? And we had an expression we called servile work. What constitutes servile work? And so we'd have all these questions. For instance, can you cut your lawn on a Sunday? Can you do this or that on a Sunday? Can a farmer do harvest on a Sunday? Uh, but let's take an example. Could you go out and cut your lawn on a Sunday? Because that's manual work, but is it right or whatever? Well, actually, it's a trick question. And, um, and I want to lead into what should happen on Sabbath in terms of that. It's a trick question for this. The first idea of Sabbath is Sabbath is meant to be unordinary time. Now there is no such a word, but I just made it up and it's a good word. It's meant to be unordinary, which means on the Sabbath you do what you ordinarily don't do. So that's why it's a trick question. What can you do on the Sabbath? Can you cut your lawn? Not if you, that's what you do for a living. If you're a computer technician, you can probably cut your lawn on a Sabbath. You know, if you are a gardener, you shouldn't do it and you can work on your computer on a Sabbath. See, the whole idea is the idea is, do what you ordinarily don't do. And see, so this retreat is going to be a Sabbath. So whatever you do in this retreat, don't do what you ordinarily do. Because then you're not on Sabbath, you're, you're on no regular time. 
See, Sabbath time is meant to break the regular time, and it's meant to be a different time, an unordinary time. You know, I do a lot of retreats for priests, and by and large, they are a very dedicated bunch of men, and a good bunch of men. But if they're supposed to come on a retreat, that's their Sabbath, and most of them don't do it. You know what? You know why? Precisely because they're dedicated. What happens is they come in to listen to the conference, then they go outside and they all get on their cell phones and they phone back to their parish. Did Mrs. Murphy die? Did this happen? See, then they're doing what they ordinarily do. They're not on Sabbath. They're simply doing ordinary time and going to a couple of conferences. See, so the first thing about Sabbath time, this is going to be a Sabbath retreat, don't do what you ordinarily do. Do whatever. <laughs> you don't have to pray, you don't have to be silent or whatever, but don't do what you normally do or you're not here on a Sabbath. See, Sabbath is different time. It's unordinary time. Secondly, it's celebration time. Sabbath is meant, first of all, to be enjoyed. It's meant to be celebration time. And you know, we used to have a sense of that. That, in fact, a lot of that is in our language. It's amazing how much theology of Sabbath is in, in the English language, and in our Western languages. So as an example, you know, if you think back a couple of generations, you know, the Sunday, which is the Christian Sabbath, okay? On a Sunday, you did things differently. First of all, before running water, back in my parents' time, people took their Saturday bath. Remember, they took a bath on Saturday, which would ready them. So first of all, you washed your body in a special way for Sunday, for the Sabbath. Then Sunday morning, you got up and you did what? You put on your best clothes. And we have that expression, you put on your Sunday best. You ever heard that expression? Yeah. See, the Sunday best, those are your Sabbath clothes, so you dressed up. The whole idea was, this is special. You don't wear ordinary clothes. You wear your best clothes, your Sunday clothes, and then you'd go to a high mass. So during the week, you had low masses, see? Then you had your highest liturgical celebration, and you'd come home and do what? You'd have your Sunday dinner. So you ate the best meal you ate during the week. So the whole idea is everything's supposed to be high. Your best dress your best prayer, the best singing, the best food. See, this is meant to be enjoyed. You know, Sabbath, first of all, is meant to be an enjoyable time. And I want you to think about that this weekend. You're here to enjoy this weekend. You're not here, you know, if nothing else, it's a Sabbath retreat is thoroughly enjoy it. <clears throat> and enjoyment isn't abstract. You know, sometimes as Christians, we get to a point where, you know, rational adults, we get to a point where we, we, we simply cannot think of enjoyment in really practical terms. You know, while I enjoy myself. No, no. Don't make it abstract. Enjoyment means food, the sun, rest, sitting in chairs. You know, you know it, enjoyment is not abstract. So what I want you to do this weekend is, this, you're on a Sabbath weekend, enjoy this. Sit around. Enjoy the sun. Eat good food. If you've snuck a bottle of wine in, Drink it, you know. If you brought along a Havana cigar, smoke it. If you have a bottle of scotch, enjoy it, you know. See, this is Sabbath. Sabbath isn't abstract. See, so in, in the Jewish, in the real Orthodox theology of Sabbath, it's almost scandalous in terms of, and we're supposed to be drawing on that, on how sensual this is. Sabbath is also meant to be a sensual experience. So for a good, pious Jew, you go to the synagogue, but you came home and you had your best meal. You enjoyed it. You sat around. And if you're an Orthodox Jewish couple, on the Sabbath, you're obliged to have sex, not just invited to it. It's an obligation. You're supposed to have the full day. <laughs> and it includes everything. You know, This is meant to be an experience of heaven, the Sabbath day. So, so Sabbath is meant to be an enjoyed experience. Remember, you know, just to... <clears throat> to uh, talk about desert retreats and so on. I remember as a seminarian. That was probably my sixth or seventh year as a seminarian. And um, <clears throat> it took that long. It wasn't that I was a slow learner. Because <laughs> <laughs> we used to go in there at 17 and 18, and you'd get ordained at 25, so it took like seven or eight years, you know. And every year we'd have an eight-day retreat to begin the school year, and we always hated it. We always hated it because it was going to be silence. We're not going to get the sports scores. We can't talk with each other. We can't listen to music. We can't socialize. So for a 19-year-old, that's a huge thing for eight days. So, oh, God, we've got to do a retreat and so on. <clears throat> and one year we had a retreat from Robert Michel. I'm going to talk about him later on, this retreat under prayer. 
wonderful French Canadian spiritual man. And he preached to us and we came in the first night and we were like 60 seminarians and he says, you really don't want to be here, do you? We said, no, we don't. He said, well, let me tell you something. You, you, I'm here to put you on a Sabbath retreat. This is your sabbatical for this year. Enjoy it. He said, claim your full eight days. This is the only sabbatical you're going to get. These are, this is your time. Relax. Just enjoy it. This is meant to be Sabbath. Well, that's what a retreat is. It's meant to be Sabbath. I'll talk later on. Maybe at times our hair is going to have to turn white for other reasons. But your first task on the Sabbath is stop doing your normal work and rest. You know, come away to rest for a while. God declared a day of rest, a day of enjoyment. And that doesn't have to have any other reason, just enjoyment for the sake of enjoyment. So this isn't abstract for these next two days. You're here. You come from busy lives. You've paid good money. Enjoy this. Somebody else is cooking for you. Enjoy the meals. Enjoy the sun. Enjoy sitting around. Enjoy not having to work. And you'll have a good retreat. Sabbath. You're here to rest. Um, that's what Sabbath is. Now, thirdly, Sabbath is meant to be reconciliation time. That's key. Partly Sabbath is for its own sake. You know what they mean when something's for its own sake as opposed to for a pragmatic reason? So I'll give you a simple example. Like imagine you have to do a class and you have to teach a class on Mozart and make a class presentation on Monday. So you spend all weekend listening to Mozart, but you're enjoying Mozart, but actually you're listening to him so you can make a presentation on him. So you're listening to Mozart, not for his own sake, you're listening to him in order to teach a class, okay? Or, suppose you don't have class to teach, you just listen to Mozart because you enjoy Mozart. Now, Sabbath is a little bit both. Why are we meant to enjoy all this stuff? Just because you're meant to enjoy it. In fact, as you're going to see tomorrow morning when we talk about Jesus, that's the center of life. You'll see Jesus sometimes celebrating Sabbath, and they said, shouldn't we have Jesus? When I come to die, I'm going to be more ready because tonight of all nights, I'm alive. I'm enjoying this, you know? that um, I'm going to read you some poetry and so on. One of our great oblate poets who died, he used to say, he says, he said, sometimes you catch yourself doing what you should have been doing all the time, just sitting in the sun and loving. You know, that's what life is all about. It's not about work. You work in order to eventually have Sabbath. Okay. See, so Sabbath is for its own sake, and all the enjoyment and the good food and the sensuality and spirituality. In the end, it's just for enjoyment's sake, but there is one pragmatic reason. You're listening to Mozart also for a pragmatic reason, and that's for reconciliation. The whole idea is we rest, we don't work, we enjoy good food, we enjoy things and so on in function of strengthening us in such a way that we can start forgiving each other, letting go. And that's also in our language. You know what we call the statue of limitations? How long is the statue of limitations? Usually seven years the length of time between sabbaticals. After seven years, you've got to give up grudges. See, in the Jewish theology of the Sabbath, after seven years, all legal debts had to be forgiven. You could only have a debt for seven years, and afterwards you have to give it up. And the major debts in ownership for land, they could only be for 49 years until you came to that jubilee year, and then you have to give up all ultimate debts and so on. So. Bluntly put in terms of spirituality, you can only carry a grudge for seven years. And then the statute of limitations runs out. The, you're supposed to have a Sabbath. Ideally, you're only supposed to carry a grudge for six days. And then you're supposed to let it go. You know, the Jewish rule, which I put in before, it's, it's got a double thing to it. That a married couple, on the Sabbath, they're obliged to have sex. That's for a double reason. One of them is because, you know, it's meant to be the Sabbath. They're meant to enjoy this. But it's also meant in terms of this. At least once a week you've got to sleep together. At least once a week you've got to forgive each other enough to be that intimate with each other. See, so it's also meant for reconciliation. So that the purpose of Sabbath is just for enjoyment, but it's also meant for reconciliation. Let me tell you how important that is and how practical that is. You ever had this experience where you, um, you're tired and you've been working, you've been waiting for a vacation, and finally, you got it programmed. And in the middle of winter, in the month of February, you're going to get to go to Hawaii for three weeks. 
with some close friends and you're going to get some sun and some rest and you look forward to this. And finally on February the 2nd there's a blizzard in St. Louis to make it all the more sweet. You get on an airplane and you, you know, 12 hours later, 8 hours later you're landing in Hawaii, it's wonderful, it's 85 above and you're there for 3 weeks in a nice 5 star hotel and you're drinking margaritas every day, you're sun tanning and you're sitting with good friends and so on. And you have this wonderful vacation. You rest and you enjoy good food and friendship and drinks and so on. You get a nice suntan. You get back to St. Louis and in four days you're just as tired as before you went. Ever had that? That happens to us. We go and we say, well, the vacation didn't really work. It worked while you were there. You went there and you had this wonderful time. You come back and in four days you're just as tired and as burned out as you were before. You know why that didn't work? You didn't forgive anybody. See, the real tiredness you know, the, the, the normal tiredness from overwork, you could sleep that off. The deep tiredness, the tiredness of soul that makes us tired, say, God, I'm tired. That speaks of unresolved tensions and lack of forgiveness and people I haven't spoke to and so on. Um, see, and that tiredness, you don't get rid of by going to Hawaii. You simply bracket it for three weeks while you're in Hawaii. You don't think about it. You come back and, geez, I can't talk to this person at work. I hate this person. She won't talk to me. I want to strangle this guy. All of that stuff stays. And in three days, mm, geez, I need Hawaii again. You know? <laughs> See, the purpose of Sabbath, so you <laughs> this is all very practical. You're here this weekend. Why? You're here to do Sabbath. So you're here. Just don't work. Enjoy. Sit in the sun. Enjoy the meals that somebody else is going to cook for you. I was talking to this woman friend of mine recently. I said, what kind of food do you like? She says, anything I don't have to cook by myself is a good meal. Okay, <laughs> okay. somebody's cooking for you. Uh, let yourself be spoiled. Enjoy the sun. Enjoy everything. Um, celebrate, but then forgive somebody. Let the statue of limitations run out on some grudges, some angers, some bitterness. That's what we need to do. See, then, then you'll have celebrated Sabbath. So that's, that's the theme of our retreat. I'm going to come back on that. I want to do this as a Sabbath retreat, not so much as a desert retreat. This is summer. You're on a beautiful spot. This is a gorgeous place to be. Uh, we're going to have nice weather. Um, enjoy this. This is meant to be a Sabbath retreat, a sabbatical. You're on a two-day sabbatical. So don't work. Celebrate. Enjoy and try to let the statue of limitations run out on a couple of grudges. Then when you go home on Sunday, it'll have been a good retreat. No silence, and silence has always been an honored thing on retreats, and it should be. But I want to say a couple of things about silence, first theoretically and then practically. First theoretically. You know, there's, there's a great spiritual tension about silence. A half of the equation is this. I want to begin by quoting Meister Eckhart, who's a great mystic. Nothing so much approximates the language of God as does silence. That's a stunning statement. Just think about that. Nothing so much approximates the language of God as does silence. So question, what language will we speak in heaven? I mean beyond English. Okay, okay, okay. No, we won't speak, have to speak any language in heaven. As Paul says, we're going to know and be known. Silence will communicate everything. In a certain sense, like, we'll just know and understand, and we already kind of get that language partly on this planet, but we've got to practice it. Silence is a language and it needs to be practiced. There are certain things you can only learn in silence. There are certain ways that you can relate that you can only do in silence. Um, you're going to see later on there are certain things you can only learn in a group. You know? But there are certain things you can only learn in silence. Let me give you a couple of examples. Back in 1984, and I wish I had the time to do it again, I need to do it again. But I went on a 40-day silent retreat in Guelph, Ontario, the Jesuit retreat house. Um, for 40 days living in silence. It was just a marvelous experience. And I was there and we were 65 people, men and women, living in a cracker box of a building, a lot smaller than this building. 
and so on. And we, we, we live together in silence. You have to pray five hours a day by yourself and a couple of hours in common and so on. And we didn't talk for 40 days. And after the treat was over, it was stunning. We were strangers when we came there. And after 40 days, we knew each other a lot better than had we talked for those 40 days. It was incredible. In fact, when our families came to pick us up, you know, we had a kind of a banquet at the end. They didn't believe we hadn't talked. They said, you couldn't know each other that well and become such deep friends without talking. It was a remarkable experience. You got to, and some of us became lifelong friends. We hadn't talked. We didn't talk for 40 days. And, but you got to know each other. There's a language that happens in silence. Uh, or, you know, Quakers. And I think if I wasn't a Roman Catholic, I'd probably be a Quaker. And see, one of their, their what, they, what they call their Quaker silences. So one of their worship services, which I really like, maybe extroverts wouldn't like it so much, but this is introversion ordered from heaven, okay. <laughs> and they, they will get together and they'll sit in a circle for an hour and nobody will say a word. And it'll be a deep communal experience, not just a deep prayer experience, it'll be a deep communal experience. And their idea is, by sitting here together in silence, and we ask God to do something for us that we can't do for ourselves, which is to bring ourselves into community. You know, we talk and we talk, and it kind of works, but kind of doesn't work either. We talk and talk, and we really don't create community with each other very much. But the silence has to be not a cold silence, it has to be a warm silence. You know, sometimes in a relationship, you don't talk to each other, but it's a cold silence. That's not making community. It's got to be a warm silence, a comfortable silence, where you sit and you get to know each other in silence. That's a language. And there's a certain work of the soul that can only be done in silence. And that's why retreats have always honored silence. With that being said, you say, however, okay, um, that's only half of it. The same as there is something you can only learn in silence, and there's certain soul work you can only do in silence, there's certain soul work you can only do by socializing. And so it's as important as this to be in silence, it's also important at times to talk with each other. And I think in the past, now your extroverts are going to like this, extroverts have been penalized in the spiritual life. You know, so you know, you, you know you're superficial and you want to be talking and so on. Well, sometimes introverts, we've got a break. I'm an introvert, you know. We've got a break because introverts oftentimes don't like to talk. They like to sneak off to their room and be alone. And sometimes that's healthy, and sometimes that's not healthy at all. See, there's only things you can, soul work you can do in silence. There's also certain soul work and social, social, certain defantasizing and certain sanity work and grounding work you can only do in a group. You know what the dangers are? I mean, you need both. See, we're social beings and we're individual beings, and both of those aspects of our souls have to be fed. And this is the danger. You know, if I never spend significant time in silence, the danger is I'm going to become pretty superficial. I can become a bit of an airhead, and I can think that Survivor is the deepest thing on television or whatever. Okay. See, so I'm not going to be really deep if I don't do that inner work. Conversely, if I don't spend a lot of time with family and socializing and so on, I might be real deep and I might be weird as hell. You know, I can really go off on weird trips by myself. See, you need what, what the, the group does. The group sanitizes, it's, it makes you sane, keeps you grounded. You can't get weird. You got to be real. Doesn't necessarily make you deep, okay? If I only spend time with a group, I never alone, oftentimes I'm real sane. I'm real sane. I'm just, you know, a paradigm of sanity. People like being around me because you're an anchor of sanity. Not a weird bone in your body. No, no, not a deep bone in your body either, you know. <laughs> See, aloneness can make you deep, can make you weird. Being with other people can make you real sane, it can make you real shallow. So you need a little bit of both. <laughs> Actually, you need a lot of both. You need significant community and social life and so on. And they'll keep you sane, keep you grounded, keep you social. And then you need time alone to do deeper inner work, which is dangerous because it can also make you real weird, but it'll make you deep. You need both. And retreats, we've always classically said, well, this is a time for a little more soul work, for a little more silence, and so on. And that's the way we've practically cut up this retreat. So that uh, from now until tomorrow night at supper time, uh, 
the introverts get their time. And then at supper time and afterwards tomorrow night we have socializing, the extroverts get their time, the Sunday morning the introverts get a little bit of time, then the extroverts get a little bit of time and so on. And, and also we, we also come here with different needs. See, um, partly there's a theology and spirituality to this, but partly it's also simply about temperament and, back, and background, where you're coming from. See, we come here from different spaces, and some come here with a deep need for silence. Others come with a deep need to socialize, and they're both very valid. As an example, I was provincial of our order in central Canada for six years in the 90s. And each year we would have our convocation of priests in August, and we'd have our retreat in May. And at the convocation, we talk about a retreat. Who should we get for a retreat director? Should we have silence? How much silence? So on. And the question of silence was always a big argument. And it would always be, somebody would stand up and say, if we don't have silence, I'm not coming. Because what is a retreat without silence? I come here to pray. I don't come here to socialize. Somebody else would stand up and say, I come here to socialize. <laughs> and I remember one year, one of our younger priests and a great man, but he was doing some really tough frontline work on some native reserves by himself. Uh, man, everybody really respected his stuff. said, I don't want any silence on the retreat. He said, I live alone. I get all I want during the year. He said, I live by myself. I'm silent all the time. He said, I see you guys twice a year. I want to talk. You know, it's valid. Somebody else stood up and said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a counselor and I talk all day and the last thing I need to do in this retreat is to talk. It's not that one's right and one's wrong. They're both right. They're coming from very different spaces. One is coming from a reserve where he lives by himself and he's very lonely and he's coming to meet his brothers and he wants to be with people and socialize. Another guy's coming from a very intense kind of a life where he's trying to get away from talking and away from people and away from socializing. And it's not that one's right or one's wrong, it's they're coming with different needs. So you come here from different spaces, different needs, you have different needs for silence. So one of the things we do is, is that we, 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 we handle silence the way we handle smoking. There are places for talking and places for silence. And so sometimes to have a designated smoking room, well, we have a designated talking room, which is down this corridor. You can go there and talk to your heart's content or outside there's about 3,000 acres of designated talking area, you know. Um, but we ask you to respect the silence in here and in the chapel and in the bedroom areas and so on and respect each other's needs, you know. Respect people's needs for silence and also respect people's needs to talk, you know. So those of you who need silence, don't look at those who are talking as these superficial people who can't keep silent. And the extroverts, don't look on the silent introverts as these weird people who can't socialize, you know. Um, no. In fact, it's probably some truth in both, but anyway, <laughs> that's not the point. Okay. Some years ago, a man called Wayne Mueller, I'll bring in the book tomorrow morning and show it to you, he wrote a book called Sabbath. It's a classic little book. And I've just taken some of the spirituality and theology out of it and, and summarized it in these 30 aphorisms. And when I want to run through a few of these, not all of them, but I want to read some of them and talk with you just the, the, the wisdom of Sabbath, okay? So number one, he says, to allow oneself to be carried away by a multitude of conflicting concerns, to surrender to too many demands, to commit oneself to too many projects, to want to help everyone in everything is to succumb to violence. Life becomes a maelstrom in which speed and accomplishment, consumption and productivity have become the most valued human commodities. In this trance of overwork, we take everything for granted. We consume things, people and information. We do not have time to savor this life, nor to deeply and gently care for ourselves, our loved ones, our world. Rather, with increasingly dizzying haste, we use them up and throw them away. See, that describes a typical week for us sometimes. You know, there's so many demands as people, and we do this and stuff, where, where our lives become a little bit like a car wash. You know how you, when you go in these car washes, you bring your car in, and then you, you park it there, and they say, now, now, you know, leave it in neutral, take your hand off the foot and the brake, and so on, and we'll just suck you through. So you sit there and this thing just pulls you through and stuff happens and so on. You come off the other side. Well, sometimes that's our typical day. Your alarm goes off at 6 in the morning, you hit it, and you just get on the car wash. 
you got to do this, you got to do that, and then you drive to work and you're drinking your coffee and you're stopping at Starbucks en route and you get there and you do this and so, and at 6 o'clock you get home and then you cook supper and then you lay out the stuff for tomorrow and at 11 o'clock you collapse into bed and you went through. That's not necessarily bad. Um, but see, our lives become so busy and life takes us and that's going to happen. If you're a busy person in the pro really a, a, a sensitive person in your generative years, a lot of your days and weeks are going to be like that. Don't apologize, but build in Sabbath. See, this will only hang you if you don't have Sabbath. There's got to be times when the wheel stops. See, that's what Sabbath, it stops this. It says, I can do this for six days, but I can't do it for seven. You know, you stop for one day and you see, this day, it stops. Then, Sabbath honors the wisdom of dormancy. If certain plant species, for example, do not lie dormant for winter, they will not bear fruit in spring. A period of rest in which nutrition and fertility most readily come together is not simply a human psychological convenience, it's a spiritual and a biological necessity. A lack of dormancy produces confusion and erosion in the life force. We too must have periods in which we lie fellow and restore our souls. You know, he picks up a great image here. A lot of plants, what they have to do, they're not, they, they don't produce year-round. They, they, in northern trees and stuff, you see it where they actually shed their leaves and they simply, they simply go quasi-dead for part of the year. Then at a certain point, they pick it all back up again. But that time, when it seems like they're doing nothing, you know, just the tree looks like it's dead. It's not dead. It's taking nutrients into it. It's getting ready so that when it's time to, to grow again, it's ready. See, or, or, or farmers who fellow fields. That's an image, that's a wonderful image. If, 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 if you keep, you know, planting a field all the time, at a certain point, its nutrients run out. It simply doesn't produce right. So at times, you simply have to leave it fellow. So a farmer just tills the field for a year and doesn't seed it. And then when he tills and he seeds it again, it produces our souls and our bodies and our hearts and our minds are like that. There's got to be times to just lie fellow. And it seems like you're not doing anything, but you're doing everything. See, so for Sabbath, when you sit on a chair tomorrow, you don't have to be thinking thoughts about God or praying or thinking holy thoughts or reading a deep spiritual book. Just sit in a chair. Just sit there. Don't care what happens. Just sitting. You're fellow. <laughs> you're dormant. You're honoring the wisdom of dormancy. Stuff is happening under the surface. You know, you're taking in nutrients unconsciously. You don't know it. One of our priests, who was a pretty busy guy, he is retired now. But when he was the really, you know, in, in, in the, precisely in the car wash, just of all the duties and stuff, one day he told me, he says, you know, he said, Father, when I retire, he said, I'm going to buy a rocking chair, and I'm going to sit in that chair, and after about six weeks, I'm going to slowly start rocking. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> see, see, he he was longing for the wisdom of dormancy. See, so Sabbath isn't just thinking holy thoughts and praying. You can do that too. It simply means sitting. It's I'm doing nothing. No. Sometimes when it seems like you're doing nothing, you're doing what you really need to do. Or sometimes you've ever had this experience, you come home after a busy day. You don't want to do anything. You don't even want to watch television. You don't want to cook. You, don't, you just want to sit in a chair. Honor that. Mm -hmm. See, it's the wisdom of dormancy. It's your body, your mind saying, enough. The Italians say, basta. I just want to sit. I just want, I'm in a little bit of a recovery state here. You know, It's the plant saying, I need to take in some nutrients before I can function again. See, that's, <coughs> Sabbath honors that wisdom. Sometimes just sit. You don't have to think. You don't have to pray. Just give your body, your mind, your heart, your spirit, it's just, just to be, just sit. What are you doing? Nothing, but it's great. See, that's Sabbath. Sabbath need not be a year or even a day. Sabbath may also be a Sabbath afternoon, a Sabbath hour, a Sabbath walk. Sabbath is time off the wheel when we take our hand from the plow and let God and the earth care for things while we drink, if only for a few minutes, from the fountain of rest and delight. That's a good line. See, sometimes they say, well, you know, I'd like to rest, but nah, I don't have a lot of time today, or I don't have time in this season. I'm too busy right now. 
See, Sabbath doesn't have to be a day. It doesn't have to be a half day. It doesn't have to be an hour. You can have a Sabbath walk. You can have a Sabbath scotch. You can have a Sabbath cigar. <laughs> just, just some, where you just, it can be five minutes. It can be an hour. It can be where you just say, it's time off the wheel. I want to give that to you in a simpler terminology. I once took a, a very, very good course from James Gill, the Jesuit psychiatrist who since died. Wonderful man, and, and a man with a great grasp on, you know, emotional and psychological health and spiritual health. And Gill said, this is a little bit of different terminology, but it captures this. Gill says, give you a little rule for health. Every day, give yourself something that day to look forward to. And he said, I'll give you an example. He was teaching at the University of San Francisco. He said, I have a class this morning. He says, and I have a class and some, some clients and stuff this afternoon. He said, but I have an hour and a half free for lunch. So I st stopped at Subway this morning, and I bought myself a sandwich, and I've got it wrapped, and I have a cold Miller beer, and at noon I'm going to drive down to the ocean, and I'm going to eat that sandwich, and I'm going to drink that beer sitting by the ocean. He said, and I'm looking forward to that all morning. <laughs> it's, it's not a big thing. He said, but all morning I'm looking forward to that, that beer and that sandwich by the ocean. See, he was going to have a Sabbath hour. That was a Tuesday or a Wednesday. It doesn't have to be Sunday. It doesn't have to be a day. See, I'm looking forward to that. I'm going to sit there. I'm going to sit by the ocean. It's celebratory. You're enjoying it. It, re it rests your spirit. Okay. Now, if Sabbath is more than the absence of work. It's not just the day off when we catch up on television or our errands. It's the presence of something that arises when we consecrate a period of time to listen to what is most beautiful, nurturing, or true. It is time consecrated with our attention, our mindfulness, honoring the quiet forces of grace and spirit that sustain and heal us. See, so Sabbath is not just, I stop resting and then, you know, I can do the laundry that day and I can get some other errands done. Notice that's, it's unordinary, but you're just filling in. You're still pragmatically. It says, yeah, Sabbath is, is a time to try to listen. And that doesn't have to be conscious. You sit in a chair, just you stop life so that life can speak to you, so that deeper things can speak to you. Traditionally, Sabbath is honored by lighting candles, by gathering and worship and prayer, by blessing children, by singing songs, by keeping silence, by walking, reading scripture, making love, sharing a meal, just as we wait until darkness falls before we can see the stars, so does Sabbath quietly wait for us. Beautiful line. But I want to jump to number 12 and do a major point which is the subtitle of our retreat, okay? And it's a line from the mystic poet. He's a Sufi, Islamic mystic poet, wonderful man called Rumi. And he says, what I want to do is to leap out of this personality and then to sit apart from that leaping, for I have lived too long where I can be reached. That is a good line for today. I have lived too long where I can be reached. Let me talk about that. You know, today, cell phones, email, intranet, they are making us the most efficient, communicative people that have ever walked this planet, by a long shot. Today we are the most efficient, most connected, most communicative people that have ever lived. I'm also c concerned that it's making us the most tired, distracted, weary people that have ever lived. You know, those are wonderful things. Cell phones, email, iPods, all this communication. It, it's wonderful, except this. Now we're all living where we can always be reached. You can't go on vacation anymore. You can't get away from the stuff anymore. It, we're permanently available. I want to give you an image of that. I was sitting in an airport recently, and I was waiting to get on an airplane. There was this young lad, probably in his early 20s. He was sitting on the floor so he could plug in a number of his little machines there and so on. So he's sitting there and he seemed pretty happy and content with himself, but he was working on a laptop. He was talking on a cell phone. He had an iPod in the other ear. <laughs> so he was doing three things visibly, you know. And I suspect if you had talked to him, he'd said, well, I can multitask, okay? Well, that's a euphemism. Multitasking is a euphemism. First of all, it just means I can walk and chew gum at the same time, okay? <laughs> Uh, that's not a big deal. We've always multitasked. Anybody can walk and chew gum is multitasking. But it's a euphemism for saying, I can be inattentive to two or three things at the same time. You know? Now, I don't want to be cynical. He probably is pretty efficient. He can do a lot of things. 
So I, don't, I, I would give him high marks for efficiency, but I wouldn't bet a nickel on his contemplative capacities. How can we, you know, do any soul work, be connected to anything, when we're doing three things on the surface all at once? And I want to pick on him. That's all of us. It's all of us. This man who wrote The World is Flat, Friedman, he just recently said, he says, you know what's going to happen with this? We're all going to end up with partial attention deficit disorder where we're so attentive to so many things that we're not really attentive to anything. See, we, we, we are developing into wonderfully efficient, communicative, multitasking, we know all this stuff and we're always connected and so on, but we're not contemplatives. Like, we're, we're all living too long where we can be reached. And, and I think the cell phone, the internet, email, and I live on that too, makes my work possible and so on um, and as wonderful as those things are they're, they're also I mean they're, they're, they're deeply affecting our capacity for Sabbath they're deeply affecting our capacity for deep soul work I mean uh, how do we how do we do deep soul work when, and how, do, how are we really conscious when, when, we're, when we're too conscious of too many things I have some friends of mine a couple and he's an Episcopalian priest, and a very good one. She's a woman uh, married to this priest and so on, works in church ministry, actually in the Roman Catholic Church and so on. And they say, and they live very, very busy lives. They sent me an email recently, said how they celebrate Sabbath. He said, you know, he said, my, my husband's a priest, so he has to work Sundays till basically supper time. He said, so he comes home on supper time on Sunday. He said, he said then we begin Sabbath. And so we begin it this way, we symbolically unplug the computer, we turn off our cell phones, we unplug the house phone, so we make ourselves unreachable. And until supper the next night, we're out of circulation. Nobody can reach us and we don't reach out. So then we go for walks and we do things and uh, so on, so we celebrate Sabbath. But notice how to symbolically begin it. You know, and then, then they come back Monday night, they plug everything in, <laughs> charge up the cell phones, take the messages and so on. See, then you're back on the wheel. And then you, you, know, you can have six days of intensity and so on, and you do the emails and the iPods and everything else and so on. It's not that they're against this, but notice how to symbolically begin Sabbath. Unplug the computer, turn off the cell phone, shut off all the machines, unplug the house phone. You know, they can't be reached. They can't be reached. Then they can do Sabbath. They can do something else. They can concentrate on each other. They can concentrate on deeper things. They can enjoy life. Um, See, most of us want to have Sabbath, but we also want this other stuff too. So we leave the, the phone on and we check our email and we do this and then we're like rummy. We are living too long where we can be reached. We're not on Sabbath. Okay, a couple more. On sabbatical we say, today I'm going to pamper my soul. You might add also your body. This is your formula for the week. Say, this weekend I'm going to pamper my soul, I'm going to pamper my body. If we forget to rest, we will work too hard and forget our more tender mercies, forget those we love, forget our children and our natural wonder. So God gave us a commandment to observe the Sabbath. Remember to rest. This is not a lifestyle suggestion, but a commandment, as important as not stealing, not murdering, not lying. He's making a wonderful point here. You know, remember to keep holy the Sabbath day is the only commandment we've taken and we've completely watered it down to become a lifestyle suggestion. See, we, we don't ever say, well, you know, don't murder, well, unless it's not convenient and so on, you know. Don't lie, don't commit adultery, unless it's not convenient and so on. But we've done it with this one. We have simply taken a commandment that's the same as not stealing, murdering, lying, adultery, and we've turned it into a lifestyle suggestion. You know, that's kind of nice. You can do this. You can take Sundays off and kind of, you know, kind of nice. If you can't, well, we understand. Well, he's making a good point here. This isn't a lifestyle suggestion. That's a commandment. It's one of the big ten. You know, like don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't murder, don't lie. Remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. Uh, this is stunning kind of when he puts it that clearly. This is not a lifestyle suggestion. This is a commandment. The commandment to remember to keep holy the Sabbath day is a loving reminder to take full advantage of a condition that already exists. At rest, our souls are restored. This is the only commandment that begins with the word remember. 
as if it refers to something we have already forgotten. Now it's interesting. None of the commandments say that thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, and this one begins remember, which means it's something you already knew. In our genetic makeup, in our DNA, we already know we're supposed to be doing this stuff. You know, remember to stop work. Remember to unplug your phone. Remember to shut it off. Remember to stop it, you know, for, for your own health. Remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. Sabbath is a time when we retreat from the illusion of our own indispensability. I suffer with that and so do many others, you know. I'd like to do this, but you know, my work is so important and what I'm doing is so important. Like, like I, you know, I really can't not do this. You know, the illusion of our own indispensability. I've had some, some major shocks in my life when I've had to go away sometimes and found out the world continued wonderfully without me. <laughs> and it'll continue wonderfully without me when I die. You know, we're, we're all so dispensable. Sometimes we get sick. We got to step off the wheel anyway. You know, and life goes on and sometimes goes on better than when we were there. And yet, I can't let it go. And we run ourselves into ulcers and high blood pressure and I have to do this. Uh, I struggle with that. I'm sure many of you do too. Plus, in our culture, workaholism is the only addiction that, that you get stroked for. See, if you're, a, if you're an addict in anything else, sooner or later they flush you out and say, you're unhealthy, you gotta go to a clinic and get yourself dried out here. If you're a workaholic, you say, isn't he a wonderful man? <laughs> See, I'm an addict, but I get, I, you know, people think I'm wonderful. I'm a workaholic, but I get all kinds of strokes for that, and so do we. See, every other addiction we get nailed for. They say, oh, she's sick, he's sick, get him to a clinic, do an intervention. Do some workaholism, no. She's so generous. He's just this wonderful, wonderful priest. He's killing himself for us and so on. Honey, he's an addict. You know, he doesn't know how to stop and so on. Um, and see, we're also living with the illusion of our own indispensability. If I ever stopped, the world would stop turning. So I just have to keep running and running and running because um, it's making me feel important. See, Sabbath stops all of that. You're on Sabbath. Sit in a rocking chair and slowly start rocking. Thank you.